Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning on a topic which is uh, close to my heart. We seem to be getting closer with every press conference given by the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship. Uh, what I want to do this morning is not so much do a presentation relating to black letter law, but uh, seek to uh, set the discussion of asylum in a wider uh, political context, uh, both uh, international, and in this sense I've mentioned I've just returned from Afghanistan where I was looking at some of the factors that come into play in driving people to uh, seek asylum elsewhere, uh, and also in terms of the domestic environment within which law becomes but one of a range of factors shaping the way in which public policy uh, towards those with claims of having been persecuted um, will be uh, determined. Uh, and here I think we run into an arena of immediate complexity, uh, which is because of the intersection of domestic law and international law. And the domestic law framework runs the risk of being hostage to the political environment within which legislative change is being put in place. And it would be, I think, a commonplace observation from specialists in public policy that uh, the policy making process does not necessarily produce uh, mechanisms that will optimally address a problem, but rather mechanisms that are at least in part designed to satisfy the demands of constituents, particularly those who are located in marginal seats. And it's not necessarily uh, those perceived swinging voters who are going to be the best source of insightful guidance as to how policy should be uh, shaped. Uh, this is where the role of the courts in ameliorating the impact of uh, what on occasion is close to lunatic policy uh, can be quite important. Uh, and this makes protection of the rule of law as a political principle extremely significant. And I think one of the problems that we have witnessed in perhaps the last 15 to 20 years has been persistent attempts by the state to insulate administrative decision making in the immigration area from uh, effective scrutiny by the judiciary uh, through things like uh, privative clause uh, legislation. And one of the consequences of uh, going down that particular path is that at a certain point it can, it can become almost a matter of win for decision makers whether they follow the law or not. And if you succeed in insulating decision making from legal scrutiny, it's, there's nothing more predictable than that the quality of decision making will uh, degrade over time and you will end up with scandals like the uh, Cornelia Rao and the Vivian Solon cases. And here I think it's worth bearing in mind looking at another area of public policy that one of the reasons that elections in a country such as Australia are so well run is that every electoral official at both Commonwealth and state level knows that irregularities are likely to lead to immediate challenges in the court of disputed returns. And this prospect of detailed and on occasion harsh scrutiny by the judiciary is an enormous stimulus to quality in decision making, uh, which is then lost if you succeed in insulating the administrative process from judicial oversight. Well, in um, the international framework, um, States have a range of duties to uh, refugees, and some, of course, take the form of legal responsibilities that have been voluntarily assumed. And in Australia, the principal relevant articles there are the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and the 1967 Protocol. The Menzies government acceded to the Refugees Convention in 1954. The Whitlam government acceded to the Protocol in 1973. Uh, however, there are other deeper bases to which one can point which also are relevant to the claims of refugees. One which is an underpinning of the validity of the convention itself as uh, an instrument is the whole notion of pacta sunt servanda, the promises should be kept in international law, together with the, uh, the broader requirement of good faith implementation of commitments uh, in an international legal framework. There can also be uh, arguably duties towards refugees under customary international law. Uh, and recently, Professor Larry May has argued that the non refoulement obligation towards refugees, that refugees shall not be expelled to a territory where they would face persecution, uh, has the form of a peremptory norm of international law or use cogent. Now, that remains to be litigated. 
but these kinds of factors, I think, point to the complexity of the international environment within which obligations arise towards refugees. There is, however, one element which I want to uh, mention too, which often doesn't get taken into account in this area, and this, that's the following, that refugees, in a sense, are symptoms of the failure of a system of states to provide universal protection for human beings. One of the great justifications for a system of states of the sort that we track back to the Peace of Westphalia 1648 is that it, in principle, should create for each citizen a state which can perform protective responsibilities towards that individual. But we all know as a matter of reality that there are states in the world that do no such thing, that either are failed or collapsed or uh, disrupted states that lack the capacity to provide protection to ordinary people, even to ensure their basic survival, or there can be states which actively persecute individuals. Uh, and it's worth noting there that more people have been killed in the 20th century by states uh, than were uh, moving against their own persons than were killed in all the interstate wars of the, the 20th century. You just put together the Yuzhokshina in the Soviet Union uh, and the, the Great Leap Forward in uh, China in the 1950s and you're well towards a, a, a figure counting in the many millions. Uh, now, given that there are many states that themselves claim the benefits of this system by asserting sovereignty as uh, uh, a fundamental basis for their existence. Uh, it can be argued, and it's been plausibly argued by Emma Haddad in a recent book, that this very willingness to accept the benefits of the system of states creates parallel obligations towards those whom the system has failed, those we call refugees. And I think from an ethical point of view, this is a very strong argument indeed. Nonetheless, what we have witnessed in the 60 or so years since the Refugee Convention uh, was uh, finalised as a text is multiple examples of states, in particular developed countries, trying to find ways in which to uh, evade the responsibilities the Convention itself creates. Uh, and this is uh, in part a problem that arises because the bulk of refugees in the world flee uh, to uh, countries uh, in which um, neighbouring uh, territories uh, become the obvious point of uh, refuge. For example, it just recently we've seen Turkey receiving on occasion 10,000 Syrian refugees in a single day. And Turkey recently at the meeting of the uh, Executive Committee of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva committed itself to keeping that border open despite the very substantial numbers it's facing. On the other hand, more remote developed countries have very often um, conceived of themselves as territories of resettlement, the implication being that even though they may have immediate obligations towards refugees by being parties to the 51 Convention, their preferred approach to the refugee situation is in effect to engage in cherry picking, uh, to move into environments in which refugees are concentrated and select from within the refugee populations in other parts of the world those whom they wish to resettle to their own territory. Now, on occasion, this can uh, be an effective device for protecting people for whom a country of first asylum is an inadequate uh, source of refuge. But in some circumstances, it becomes little more than a mechanism for managed migration. Uh, and I remember a senior UNHCR official, uh, Dr. Gary Troller, many years telling, ago, telling me that he'd been visited when he was head of the UNHCR office in uh, Nairobi by an Australian uh, official who was engaged in refugee resettlement. Uh, and the Australian official said, well, uh, uh, you're an American, I'm an Australian, we speak the same language. What we're looking for are English-speaking engineers. And uh, Dr. Troller said, well, there's a problem there. I can give you some non-literate women who've been raped. And at that point, the Australian official's face fell. Uh, and uh, John Menadieu, the former secretary of the Department of Immigration and Ethnic Affairs has made the point in writing that very often uh, the most vulnerable refugees, the, those in greatest need of resettlement, are not necessarily going to be those who will figure on the priority listing, the real priority listing of uh, resettlement countries. There can be all sorts of political factors that come into play. Thus, at the moment, uh, Australia's just committed itself in the next year to resettle 1,200 Bhutanese refugees from, uh, from Nepal. Now, uh, um, they're not in an easy situation, but I think few people uh, 
on the whole, would say that they are the, the most needy refugees in the world when it comes to resettlement. But the story here is that the United States, some years ago, looking for ways to fill its resettlement quota with non-Muslims, settled on uh, Bhutanese refugees in Nepal as a nice group to which uh, to lend support. And this has then cascaded into the programs of a number of other resettlement countries as well. Uh, now, the danger that associ is associated with the prevalence of these kind of resettlement programs is that it can spawn uh, a discourse of queuing, in which case uh, countries such as Australia uh, draw a distinction between bad refugees who are those who turn up at the border and assert the uh, rights that they may be granted under the 51 Convention to seek asylum, and good refugees who in effect are those who fall in with bureaucratic processes which have been designed by the agencies of the state. Now, the, the whole metaphor of, uh, of a queue is a toxic and corrupting form of language. Because uh, as we understand queues in a country such as Australia, if you're in a shop and you are queuing at the bacon counter, for example, uh, when you get to the head of the queue, uh, you will be sold bacon if there's any bacon left, and uh, you won't be excluded from the queue on some extraneous ground. By contrast, we know that the very large majority of people who are individually assessed in countries of first asylum and found to be refugees will not be resettled by any country. Uh, and the, the, the most recent estimate I've seen is that there are about 100,000 resettlement places available each year and about 500,000 people who are seen as in desperately urgent need of immediate resettlement. This, of course, is where people smuggling emerges because uh, any, any economist will tell you that if you have a large discrepancy between a good in high demand and the supply of that good, you will get a black market emerging to meet that particular type of demand. And that's precisely what uh, people smugglers do. It's also the case, however, that uh, the Q metaphor breaks down because very often resettlement countries uh, don't uh, just take into account the need of refugees when they are uh, choosing people for resettlement. For example, uh, disabled refugees can be excluded from resettlement. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is something which Australian law still permits, although on occasion there have been waivers that have uh, overcome that particular a problem, but uh, there was an inquiry by a parliamentary committee a couple of years ago, to which the government has just responded somewhat inadequately, uh, which pointed out cases such as uh, a woman hacked with machetes during the Rwandan genocide, who was then blocked for resettlement on the grounds that the injuries that she had sustained as part of that campaign of persecution would be expensive to treat in a country like Australia. Um, and you can see the kind of theatre of the absurd into which one can be entangled when the reality of resettlement programs as opposed to the rhetoric comes to the fore. In, in effect, for large numbers of people in the world, resettlement programs offer not a place in a queue, but a ticket in a lottery. Um, I have a deeper problem with this approach too, which is that Australia, in a sense, in 1954, when the Menzies government acceded to the Refugee Convention, assumed voluntarily a whole set of responsibilities. And it's always seemed to me that one should not be able to evade one's voluntarily assumed responsibilities simply by engaging in discretionary activity, which may be as much for one's own benefit as for the benefit of those who are in need. Uh, and that the fact that a country may make resettlement places available is no foundation whatsoever for shrinking from uh, uh, honouring to the full the obligations that have been assumed under international law. Now, another area in which the evasion of responsibility surfaces um, comes through the attempt to deter people from um, uh, reaching a place where they can put in an asylum claim in the first place. Uh, and uh, here, I think the whole issue of good faith implementation of legal obligations surfaces very powerfully. Um, and here I think there's a kind of contradiction which uh, always lurks just below the surface in the public policy sphere here. And it was very much uh, uh, a contaminating factor where the expert panel on asylum issues which reported in, August, in, in uh, early August this year was concerned. Namely the notion that you can have kind, gentle deterrence. Uh, the report of the expert panel proposed the reopening of an offshore processing centre on the island of Nauru, 
as a way of deterring people from coming to Australia, but uh, anticipated that it would not be the kind of hellhole that Nauru had proved to be um, in the earlier iteration of the Pacific Solution under the Howard government. Now, the contradiction here is that if you're going to deter people from uh, approaching a country for asylum, particularly if they're fleeing uh, a, an environment in which you can be shot dead, um, you almost by definition are going to have to make life pretty nasty for them. And indeed, we saw a reflection of this in the press this morning when Amnesty International, having reviewed the current situation in Nauru, described it as appalling, and a spokesman for a minister was reported having said, well, it's no bad thing that they're saying that because it helps get the message out. Uh, and one wonders what kind of moral creatures are inhabiting moral ministers' offices these days, but I think I could offer some guesses. Um, the, uh, in, in a sense, a great deal of deterrence is, is concerned with what ethicists call the, the issue of vicarious dirty hands. Uh, you, you want to do the dirty to people, but you want it to happen in a more remote kind of world. Uh, and in a sense, this links into a particular item of rhetoric which I find nauseating at the moment, which is the suggestion that, that deterrent measures towards refugees are concerned with saving life at sea, and to that I would say nonsense. Uh, the measures that are being put forward are uh, simply mechanisms to ensure people drown uh, politely in more remote oceans of the world. We live in an integrated world. Uh, if uh, people who are desperately fleeing a country like Afghanistan can't get to a place like Australia, they're going to end up in the hands of the Russian mafia. Uh, they will get to Greece. Uh, they will find that there is a zero acceptance rate for Afghan cases in Greece. Uh, and they will end up in the hands of people smugglers who will put them on boats trying to get them to Italy uh, and other parts of Europe, and they will drown in the Mediterranean, happily away from our gaze. Uh, but uh, we, we shouldn't uh, delude ourselves that, that uh, we control the entire space within which people are making decisions in, in this particular sphere. Uh, uh, if people are truly desperate, deterrent measures simply become a, a device for making their lives miserable uh, after they've been found to be refugees and for making their resettlement prospects in other parts of the world grimmer and grimmer. That brings me more specifically to some issues relating to the current policy settings and the expert panel. And I'd like to begin there with the observation that the 1951 convention, in terms of the sociological phenomenon, of uh, refugees is uh, no great thing. Refugees existed before the 51 Convention was drafted, and even if every state in the world repudiated and denounced the 51 Convention, it's not going to do away with the phenomenon of refugees, because refugees move because of the fear of persecution in their countries of nationality, and as long as states continue to be agents of persecution or to be incapable of preventing persecution by other actors, flight will be an obvious choice for people to uh, pursue. Um, in that sense, uh, the notion that you can opt out of the realities of a world in which these kind of movements occur um, is, um, is fairly fanciful. And probably the best state approach for states to take is simply to honour their obligations under the 51 Convention. If people arrive and they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for the reasons that the Convention sets out, then they should be given uh, protection uh, in accordance with the spirit of the Convention and some of its specific terms. Now, the reason that that doesn't happen is, uh, in, in many countries in the world now is domestic politics. That in democratic environments, there can be costs for political actors in honouring obligations under instruments of international law. And for those who aspire to remain in public office, this is a significant threat. So in uh, quite a number of different countries, one has seen pressure from domestic political context to erode the protections which the Refugee Convention provides uh, and to uh, dis discourage people from seeking to uh, access them in the first place. And this is, in a sense, where the law comes in as a basis for the constraining of power, because a point that I make consistently to my students is that we, we don't simply live in a democracy. Uh, in Australia, we live in a constitutional democracy in which 
what government does is subject to the constraints of law. And here I, I'm always haunted by the comment that, that Lord Denning quoted in Gourier's case back in 1976 from the, uh, the 18th century thinker Thomas, Thomas Fuller, be you never so high the law is above you. This is an enormously important uh, point to bear in mind when we're looking at uh, some of the horrors which states are capable of uh, inflicting on people at the behest of rabid elements within uh, the domestic political environment. Um, and uh, we actually have documentation of the role of domestic politics in this sense. There's a very interesting passage in the biography of Prime Minister Howard that was written by uh, Wayne Errington and Peter Van Onselen some years ago, and it's, uh, this particular um, anecdote came from a taped interview with a cabinet minister, or a minister in the Howard government, uh, uh, Jackie Kelly. I'm not sure whether she ever made it to cabinet now that I think about it, but um, she was the member for a Western Sydney constituency. And she recorded that on the day the Prime Minister announced in the House of Representatives that the vessel known as the Tampa would not be allowed to uh, land on Australian territory, she buttonholed him on his way into the chamber and said, Prime Minister, I have a big problem with the One Nation Party. They're moving into my electorate. They've taken over the two best fundraising branches in the electorate, and I don't know what to do about it. And according to Kelly, the Prime Minister waved his speech notes at her and said, don't worry, Jackie, that's all about to change. And um, that, I think, is one of the most potent um, accounts of the way in which domestic politics feeds in a, in a poisonous way into this area of public policy. The swinging voters at the 2001 election in Australia were not hip pocket nerve voters. They were the people who had voted for the One Nation Party in 1998 and who, because of the organisational collapse of that party, were up for grabs in 2001. And the then government was not in a position to do an explicit deal with the One Nation Party because of the uh, terrible relations between One Nation and the Nationals in Queensland. So the next best way in which to pursue uh, their votes was to find a set of policy settings that would lure them uh, and to, to the government's side. In 1998, those who supported One Nation in the federal election came in about a 50-50 split from the two major parties. In 2001, those ex-One Nation voters went back to the government on a 90-10 split. So it worked as a strategy. Now, that I think also explains a lot of what we're seeing uh, with the uh, expert panel chaired by Ed Chief Marshal Houston. The hidden agenda of the expert panel from the government's point of view was to provide it cover uh, for accepting the policy set settings of the opposition. The government's view was that it was he hemorrhaging support to the opposition over the issue of undocumented arrivals and the best way in which to overcome this problem was by walking away, as it were, with the opposition's clothes. But it couldn't just do that without suffering humiliation. So an expert panel that would come up with the right kind of recommendations uh, was the way to proceed. Now, that's not to say that the expert panel itself realised that this was what it was doing, but it was certainly the effect of what it did. Uh, the consequence of the expert panel's recommendations was to diffuse some of the uh, domestic debate, although that may kick off again now because of yesterday's announcement in effect by the Immigration and Citizenship Minister that the recommendations that the panel put forward have failed. But uh, I think it's already been apparent for quite some time that as a matter of public policy what the panel put forward has failed. The number of, of, of people arriving by boat since August the 13th when it was announced that people would be dispatched to Nauru has very significantly exceeded the capacity of Nauru or Manus Island to observe them, and incidentally also has made the so-called Malaysian solution numerically irrelevant to what's going on. And I think we, we're just coming to the end of a false calm before a real storm in this particular area. And the reason that we have a real storm ahead is that we haven't yet begun to confront the movement of peoples that's likely to be associated uh, with failure in Afghanistan in 2013 and 2014. There is a very large number of people, particularly from the Hazara ethnic group whom I set out to interview when I was in, in Kabul a month ago, who are terrified about what the future holds for them. And they're not even beginning to turn up in the numbers that are possible within the current uh, caseload. And to give you just one illustration of 
the kind of factors that are at play here. Um, I went out to a district of Kabul called Dashti Bachi, which is where one finds large numbers of the Hazaras living. Kabul as a city is now an extremely ethnicized area of uh, Afghanistan with different ethnic groups living in different uh, districts. And uh, I was with, uh, with uh, a Leverhulme fellow from the UK who's reading sociology at the City University of London doing a study of the experiences of um, Afghan Hazaras deported from the United Kingdom to Afghanistan. And as part of that, she was teaching one day a week at a particular school, which I went out to visit to so that I could do some interviewing with people there. And uh, she was almost in a state of shock when I arrived because she had just had a, a year 10 boys class in which they'd set out to have some open discussion of any issues that they wanted to canvas. And the issue the year 10 boys wanted to talk about was suicide. Now, the social norms against suicide in Afghanistan are extremely strong for religious reasons, as has been documented. And this, more than anything that shows up in opinion poll evidence, for me was one of those lightning flash moments that gives you a sense of exactly how terrified people are about the, pers the prospective return of the Taliban. Now, having said that, there are still some public policy settings that might be taken at the diplomatic and international realm that could avert this outcome, but I'm not at all confident that they are being pursued, and so we're staring down the possibility of a fraudulent election and a collapse in Afghanistan in 2014 that could be a trigger for an enormous outflow of people who feel that they otherwise going to be killed. Now, um, the, if one looks at the um, specific uh, way in which the expert panel put its recommendations in place, there are four particular flaws in its approach that I want to highlight, although there's one other which is figured in the popular press here, uh, mentioned by Michel Grattan last week, which is that there was simply no plan B in the uh, expert panel's recommendations uh, that could come into play if what they had put uh, in, in place as proposal didn't work. Now, that's led to a situation in which public policy in this area is now being made by panicked politicians and public servants. Um, Charles Lindblom used to talk about the science of muddling through as a model of the, the policy process, but there ain't much science at the moment, there's just a muddle. Uh, and community organisations are finding that when they try to get any guidance from bureaucrats within the Immigration Department about what's going to be done, that, that there's simply no answer because they are groping in the dark trying to find out what to do. Uh, but the four specific flaws of the Houston report which seem to be the most serious and in a sense most instructive also we're thinking about how public policy might better be done in this particular area are the following and I'll conclude with these. First, the Houston report severely underestimated the significance of push factors. It's actually relatively rare to get people in the public policy sphere here who are willing to admit that there can be very large scale push factors. The temptation is to say people come to Australia because they are lured uh, by Circe-like figures who uh, uh, put uh, soft policy settings in place and that accounts for our problem. So this then leads one down the path of saying what we need are tough new policies. How many times in the last 15 years have you heard immigration officials and ministers say we need tough new policies, we're bringing in tough new policies? Well, the problem is we can never be as tough as the tough. Uh, and the difficulty with tough policy settings is that for domestic political reasons, you put a tough policy in place and it doesn't work, it has unintended consequences. But it then becomes humiliating to back away from it and the opposition will accuse you of going soft. So uh, you can end up littering the policy space with a whole range of foolish policy settings from which it's very hard to extract yourself. And one of the classic examples of that was the provision in uh, uh, the earlier regime of temporary protection visas that those who were found to be refugees but granted only a temporary protection visa couldn't be uh, uh, given, would not be given the right to sponsor their families, immediate family members to join them in Australia under uh, an Australian migration scheme such as the special humanitarian program or, or family migration. Now the problem with that of course was that you almost would have thought people smugglers had drafted that legislative provision because it meant that if people wanted to reunite with their families, the only way to do so was by getting them on a boat. Uh, and Blind Freddy could have 
uh, observed very quickly that this was just about the dumbest kind of policy setting uh, you could wish to find. Uh, uh, Stephen mentioned earlier in his presentation the uh, mandatory sentencing for Indonesian fishermen. If what one needs is um, a regional solution to problems of asylum, the last way of building an amicable relationship with uh, uh, Indonesia as a point of commencement for such diplomacy is to lock up children in Australian jails. Uh, and I said earlier this year to the Australian ambassador in Indonesia that all we needed was one teenager from Indonesia to be raped or murdered in an Australian prison and it would set the bilateral relationship back years. And he was fully aware of that and there's been a certain retreat from that on the, by the Attorney General recently, but it's still a major problem. The second weakness in the Houston Report's approach was that it made a classic mistake in policy making, which was that of comparing a messy real world with an idealised alternative in which everything would go according to plan. Now, you hardly need to expand on that, uh, because uh, the, the problems that can flow from that kind of mindset are enormous. And yet what we saw was um, the members of the committee putting forward a very complex set of proposals, uh, which they said would work only if they were all implemented in their entirety. And that very complexity um, at the outset should have set alarm bells ringing about whether this was going to be an effective response to the policy challenge that came about. But that then related to the third problem which I want to mention, which is that implementation of policy is a highly political kind of undertaking. And to the extent that the panel proposed a complex mix of positive and negative incentives uh, for people contemplating uh, movement to Australia by boat, it overlooked the risk that uh, with an election looming and politicians trying to look tough, what we would see was rapid implementation of the nasty bits in the uh, uh, committee's report and a much more sluggish approach to implementation of anything that might be seen as uh, welcoming or generous or in effect providing an alternative route to boats for access to Australia. And frankly for an expert committee to assume that complex recommendations will be implemented in a comprehensive and, in, uh, and integrated fashion is naive in the extreme. The real world just doesn't work like that and anyone who's floated around Canberra should be alert to that. But the fourth point I'd make, and I'll conclude with this, is the no advantage test, which we've seen trumpeted in the last couple of days by the Minister, is in effect simply a repackaged version of the discredited idea of a queue. I think Ellen may have said something about uh, no advantage in uh, her remarks uh, this morning. Um, the message of a no advantage test, in effect, is that even if people have, have to save their lives, they shouldn't be able to seek a better outcome through their own initiative than a bureaucracy is prepared to deliver to them. And yet when what bureaucracies are prepared to deliver is a product of the domestic politics of the countries in which those bureaucracies are located, why would anyone rational put their faith in foreign states as the sole source of protection for them when their lives are at risk? And although I didn't bring it with me, there is a passage in a 1941 book by William Russell called Berlin Embassy, which speaks directly to this uh, particular challenge. Uh, William Russell was a young American who worked as, was studying in Berlin and worked as a locally employed staff of the US Embassy uh, up until its closure after Pearl Harbor. And a great deal of his work was concerned with dealing with uh, people who had applied for resettlement to the United States. And there's actually a passage in the book where he recalls um, a, a Jewish lady approaching the desk where he and his colleague were working uh, because her husband was in Dachau. This is about 1939. And she was terrified that if war came, he would die. And the response that she received from uh, Russell's colleague at the desk was that, uh, that there were thousands of people ahead of him in the quota and he would have to wait at least eight years before there would be any prospect for his settlement. And she simply remarked that in that case he would die, collected the papers, and walked away. And as Russell said, it was like that each day, every day, in the US Embassy in Berlin in 1940. That, I think, is the model to which we are led if we accept no advantage tests as uh, an ethical uh, basis for 
decision making in this particular area and I think it's something that we uh, need to uh, uh, challenge uh, and every opportunity that's presented to us. So let me conclude on that point and I'm very happy to respond to any questions. You've got uh, time for quite a number of questions. Can I perhaps ask you a question sure. to start with? Howard, in his early days, was quite up on both refugees and multiculturalism. Mm. Now, when you look at Julia Aguila, clearly these two policies are going two different ways. Yes. She's very tough on refugees, and she's talking about the miracle of multiculturalism suddenly yes. to be discovering. Yes. Why is this different? What's happening? I think she's talking to different constituencies there. Uh, uh, it, uh, and one of the problems that arises here is because of a policy setting that's been in place for quite a number of years now, which is that for each protection visa granted in Australia to uh, an individual who arrives without prior authorisation, there is one less visa granted uh, to people who may have uh, been sponsored by a relative under the Special Humanitarian Program. And the effect of that linkage between the uh, honouring of Australia's onshore responsibilities and the numbers of people who've been, who will be resettled from overseas has driven a wedge between existing communities and new arrivals. And the government is very keen not to lose the support of the existing community because they vote too in Australian elections. So, uh, in a way, the demonisation of people who have been uh, arriving by boat through that wedge politics, together with an affirmation of multiculturalism, is a device for ensuring that votes are not lost in that particular uh, constituency, but at the same time one's throwing a bit of red meat to Alan Jones and, and, and people of that kind. Um, can I make one other observation, which uh, I should have made earlier too, which is that uh, governments are not squeamish about violating international law in this area. And you will have noticed from the press this morning that the minister was saying yesterday that um, uh, those who are found to be refugees uh, but who are on bridging visas will not be allowed to work. Now this is actually a flagrant violation of Article 17.1 of the Refugee Convention. If you look at, at that article it says the following, the contracting state shall accord to refugees lawfully staying in their territory the most favourable treatment accorded to nationals of a foreign country in the same circumstances as regards the right to engage in wage earning employment. Now, this has been, this was an article that was discussed extensively in the travel preparatoire um, for the convention and it's discussed in great detail in James Hathaway's um, classic text on the rights of refugees under international law. What in effect it means is that um, refugees um, in terms of their work rights, are to be given what are most favourably given to not visitors but resident nationals of another country. And in the Australian context, what that would mean is that the model that would be applied would be that of New Zealand. Because it is New Zealanders who are lawfully staying in Australia who have the most generous work rights. So under Article 17.1 of the Convention, um, people who have been found to be refugees are entitled uh, within Australia to work. Now, of course, there are some other countries in the world where no foreign nationals have work rights at all, even if they're lawfully staying in the country. And then there's another provision in Article 17.2, which says that um, uh, if somebody has completed three years' residence in the country, they're entitled to uh, um, uh, work rights as well. Uh, but uh, where and Australia, interestingly, had a reservation to the Article 17 when it first uh, acceded to the Convention in 1954, but it subsequently withdrew that reservation. And under the terms of the Refugee Convention, it's only at the initial phase of accession that you could put in reservations. You can't actually lodge reservations to the text of the Refugee Convention once you've acceded to it. So uh, Australia is fully bound by Article 17.1 of the convention and uh, I suspect we'll see some discussion of that in the next few days. I think the journalists who were at the Minister's press conference yesterday were probably not on top of the law in this, this area. But uh, and, and given that there's also a provision in the Refugee Convention for refugees to have access to the courts of the country which in which they're, in which they're uh, staying, we could see some very interesting litigation indeed around this particular matter. Any questions? Um, thanks very much for that. That was that was terrific. Um, I think you're 
probably saying some of the things some of us are feeling, but maybe not able to say, <laughs> certainly not as eloquently. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the view of uh, international law in Australia, and I was very struck by the um, statement that the Minister tabled when Nauru was listed as a regional processing country, which explicitly said, we believe this to be consensus consistent with our international obligations, but even if it is inconsistent with Australia's international obligations, I still say it's in the public interest for me to do so. Which I think is, I mean, I was kind of shocked by the sort of blatant saying, even if it's inconsistent with um, our international obligations. Um, I also just wanted to comment just very briefly on the fact that one of the, um, I think, perverse sort of outcomes of increased interdictions overseas, um, airline um, sanction, carrier sanctions, um, airline liaison officers, etc., in a way is driving asylum seekers into the hands of people smugglers because there's an increasingly small space for people to actually um, come in so-called lawful ways. Um, so that's just one of the things that I think, well, one of the ways that you could actually undercut the people smugglers is actually by providing better opportunities for people to move, uh, especially a country like Australia, which, which um, provides, what, something like 5 million tourist visas a year, an active migration program of 300,000, and yet, you know, high drama over 10,000 or even 15,000 asylum seekers arriving so-called illegally. Um, but what I really wanted to ask you, Bill, is what I think um, for us and many others is really challenging, which is, um, before you came, we spoke a little bit about public opinion polls which show consistently over a number of years that Australians do not like people arriving by boat in, a, in an unorderly or disorderly way. And we have the two major political parties which have more or less the same position on these issues. Um, how, we, how can we change that in Australia? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, several remember an expression which I understand floated around in Poland during the communist period. Uh, Professor Velitsky mentioned this to me once, which was that we shouldn't talk about consensus, we should talk about dirty togetherness. And I think that's what we've seen in a lot of cases with the major political parties, they're kind of dirty togetherness, really. That uh, um, Very often, they know that what they're saying to the public is nonsense, but they see it as polit politically rewarding. We proceeded overnight with uh, the, um, uh, the opposition leader reiterating the claim that people who arrive in Australia and seek uh, protection are acting illegally. Now, this is just nonsense. Uh, no one who says that is ever capable of identifying a statutory provision under which a charge could be laid. Um, what they actually mean is they arrive without prior authorization, but all of us in every, every aspect of our daily lives do all sorts of things that have not been authorized in advance by agencies of the state. And in a sense, there's a fairly totalitarian mindset that is reflected in that way of thinking, really, that, uh, that the state is uh, the be-all and end-all of what is appropriate uh, behaviour and we should measure what's acceptable in accordance with what the state has authorised. And uh, it, it's never, it never ceases to surprise me that people who in many areas of life are sceptical of the state and venerate the role of markets, in the sole area of refugee policy, tend to be scornful of markets as reflected in the activities of people smugglers and instead put all their faith in agencies of the state uh, when a life experience would suggest that, uh, that to trust the state in those sorts of circumstances to rescue you is very, very naive indeed. Um, of course, there was a long, for a prolonged period of time in Australia, uh, a strong consensus in favour of generosity towards refugees and um, uh, it, when the uh, movement of uh, boat people from uh, uh, Vietnam was uh, in prospect and when Australia embarked on substantial generosity towards those people, at that stage Ian McPhee, who was the Immigration Minister, and Mick Young, who was the Opposition Spokesman, toured the country virtually together, sticking up for generosity towards refugees. The problem was the genie got out of the bottle politically in 2001 uh, with um, the, the Tampa affair because it was seen as the device for saving the government's bacon in what was uh, 
politically a very uh, difficult situation. That has now led to the conviction across the major parties that uh, you lose unless you are uh, brutally tough towards asylum seekers. Um, and, uh, and it's also a way in the sense of appeasing uh, the shock jocks that uh, you might, you might uh, not be prepared to go on their shows if they say nasty things about your relatives, but uh, at least you can give them some policy settings that keep them happy. Uh, sacrifice some other people, you know. Um, I, I don't think there's any easy political way out of this. This is where I think um, dragging governments off to the court's legal mechanism one can find is the best way of proceeding. And frankly, I think the policy uh, environment at the moment is such that a lot of the measures that have been put forward are being done in a rush without adequate consideration of the legal ramifications, thereby creating opportunities for proficient lawyers uh, who can obtain instructions from clients to challenge some of these measures on, uh, on very credible grounds. As we saw, uh, when uh, David Mann briefed Debbie Mortimer um, to the High Court over the uh, Malaysian solution. And uh, I'm sure um, Chris Bowen will come out and say that he has legal advice uh, that Article 17 of the Refugee Convention doesn't prevent his having bridging visas with no work rights. And my guess would be that his legal advice will come from exactly the same people who told him that the Malaysian solution had no legal problems associated with it. Um, Incidentally, I think there's a, 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 a related but different issue here that's been canvassed by Professor Andrew Burns of uh, UNSW Law School in a book chapter recently about the professional responsibilities of people admitted as legal practitioners who are working for government departments. Because the word that one sort of hears around Canberra is that there, is, is that there are some government departments where um, if the minister wants an opinion saying that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the moon's made of green cheese, he'll be able to get it from somebody uh, uh, and then make use of it. Uh, I suspect the day will come one uh, at some point where uh, lawyers who give sort of fantastically implausible uh, opinions to support political positions by government may have to account before professional bodies for the content of uh, what they may have said. Uh, at a certain point, legal advice can be so spurious and so uh, corrupted by politics that it shouldn't be seen as legal advice, but simply buttressing of the political process. Sorry to come on at length about that. Yes, um, I thought that was a fantastic speech. Thanks very much. I have um, two questions. Um, and uh, in a sense they're rather specific and they both relate to the expert panel. And I think you pointed out very well the way the whole sort of language of the expert panel has been used to obscure and confuse in all sorts of ways. Um, so um, one part of the so-called positives was that these extra people would be coming in. Um, but I noted when I looked at where they were coming from, when I got an email through from the one of the refugee groups and the official figures, is that in fact there's only, I think, 600, if that, coming from Indonesia, and in fact no mention of any Sri Lankans at all. So I was just wondering, that doesn't seem to have come up very prominently in the discussions so far. The other thing is, um, the expert panel was very carefully constructed to claim legitimacy, and in particular the role of um, Paris Aristotle was quite significant although he played a minor role. I'm just wondering, do you think there's any chance that the expert panel could actually come out against what is happening? And in particular, has anyone um, approached Paris Aristotle about his current position? And I know that he's just been appointed to the so-called advisory panel for Nauru, which is not a good yeah. sign. Thank you. Sure. Um, on the uh, allocation of places, yes, 600 is a very small number if what one's trying to do is uh, is break the appeal of people smugglers working from within the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, and I, in a, a paper that I wrote for the, uh, to submit to the expert panel, I made the point that you would need to put far larger numbers in than that. Um, and there, it becomes an area of real complexity because initially people were saying, well, let's put more numbers into Pakistan. The problem, however, is that um, in Pakistan you have about 2 million uh, Afghan refugees. 
many of whom have been living in Afghanistan for the best part of 30 years since the Soviet invasion, who are ethnic Pashtuns, they're from the same ethnic group as the Taliban, the Sunni Muslims, uh, they probably would not be found to be refugees if they were put through an individual assessment process. But many of them have relatives living in Western countries. So if you announce, say, 2,000 resettlement places for uh, Afghans in Pakistan, you would have the system immediately clogged up by people who are probably not in need of resettlement, even if the Taliban come back, uh, because sponsors would um, uh, immediately um, support their putting in an application. Those who are in gravest danger, the Hazara Shia in Quetta, probably wouldn't get a foot in the door, and even if they did put in an application, it would probably get lost in the swamp. Uh, and at the moment, uh, the UNHCR sub-office in Quetta is, from Hazara's point of view, dangerously close to areas where the Taliban hang out, so many of them are frightened even to approach the, the sub-office there. So you have to be very, you have, need a lot of local knowledge in order to work out where it's appropriate to allocate um, resettlement places if things are going to work. But 600 is far too low if what one's trying to do is undermine the position of smugglers in Indonesia. It's a drop in the bucket, in effect. Um, the second point, the expert panel. I know all the members of the expert panel and have for some time. Two members of the expert panel, uh, Angus Houston and Michael Lestrange, would not claim to be specialists in, on refugee issues or refugee policy in any way. Um, Paris Aristotle has worked in the area for a long period of time, but particularly in the area of providing torture and trauma services support for people who have been resettled to Australia, not necessarily an expert on the diplomatic side of things. And I think myself that the view of the members of the expert panel was that the offer of new resettlement places would immediately undercut the appeal of people smuggling. And so, in a sense, Nauru would not really have to be used. Uh, that was their hope. Now, that's collapsed. The reason it's collapsed is that uh, uh, refugees have no confidence that the resettlement places in small numbers put in into Indonesia will address their problem. Um, and because the push factors are so powerful that even strong deterrent measures that Australia could try to develop are not going to be sufficient to overcome the fears which they, they face. Um, the, there is also, I want to phrase this very carefully, there is also a danger for people in the community sector to overestimate the weight that their voices will carry with those involved in the policy and particularly the political process. The danger of getting too close to government is you can be duchess. You can reach the point where you think they're listening to you, whereas in fact they're using you as a shield for the implementation of policies which they want to put into place for other reasons. Uh, and it's then a question of whether at some point you bail out or whether you continue to believe that you can do more good by being within the process than by bailing out. And that's the kind of challenge, I think, which confronts a number of people uh, in this area. Uh, and we see the same kind of issue arising for Save the Children um, on whether to become involved in supporting children who are removed to places like Nauru or Manus Island. Now, my view for what it's worth is that the evidence from psychiatrists would suggest that it is those environments per se which are toxic and that to think you can actually provide services that will keep people normal in that kind of environment is um, whistling down the wind. Uh, but this is a long-term dilemma which people in the community sector face. It's the same dilemma that confronted the International Committee of the Red Cross when it visited Theresienstadt during the Second World War. Uh, and there's no easy solution to that particular problem. Thank you very much for your time.